Fantastic Beasts is about a month and a half away, so let's keep chugging along with these reviews. So Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire is the fourth movie in the Harry Potter series based off the fourth book in the Harry Potter book series. And this film is interesting because it's the first PG-13 Harry Potter movie that we got. I remember when I first saw that, I was like, oh man, like... People are gonna die in this movie. Maybe not that, but stuff is gonna go down. And I said in my last Harry Potter review that The Prisoner of Azkaban is actually my favorite movie in the Harry Potter series. However, my favorite book in the series, that is the Goblet of Fire book. So you think that this movie coming off the heels of my favorite movie and being based off my favorite book, it'd be a really easy target to really nitpick this movie. And while I am gonna nitpick it a little bit, there's a lot to like in this movie. I gotta say though that this book is the point in the series where the book started to get a lot longer. If you guys want a size comparison, here's the spine to Prisoner of Azkaban, here's the spine to Goblet of Fire. So it's at least a good, like, like twice as long as Prisoner of Azkaban was. But this movie and the book, they both just expand the world of Harry Potter into new, like, just blazing new territories. Because you're seeing wizarding schools outside of Hogwarts, we get introduced to Durmstrang and Bo Battens in this movie. And they're at Hogwarts to compete in the Triwizard Tournament. It's this big tournament where a champion from each school gets selected, they get to compete in some tasks, and they ultimately win the Triwizard Cup. And Dumbledore phrases it as eternal glory. The way you get picked is you put your name in the Goblet of Fire. On Halloween night, the Goblet of Fire is going to spit out three names, and those are the three champions. And that's exactly what happens. On Halloween night, the Goblet of Fire shoots out some names. From Bo Battens, you have Fleur Delacour. Durmstrang, you have Victor Crumb, the famous Bulgarian Seeker. And from Hogwarts, you have Cedric Diggory. But then something happens. The Goblet of Fire shoots out another name. Whose name is it? Well, I wonder. Harry Potter is now the fourth competitor in the Triwizard Tournament. This has never happened in the history of ever. Everyone's confused about it for a couple different reasons. For one, the Goblet of Fire is only supposed to pick three names and it picked four for some reason. And two, you have to be 17 to enter the Triwizard Tournament this time around, so everyone thinks Harry cheated into entering his name. A lot of friends and Cedric supporters, they don't believe Harry that he didn't actually enter his name. Even Ron's not taking his side. And so it creates for some interesting tension between Ron and Harry in this movie. It's really the first time in the series that you see Ron and Harry bickering. Like in most movies, it's Ron and Hermione bickering and Harry has to be the peacekeeper, but in this movie, it's Hermione that has to do that and Harry and Ron are the ones that are fighting. But it is a bummer to see. It's like in Spider-Man 2 how you just see Peter getting hounded on the entire time. Harry Potter has a very similar thing. Especially in this movie when everyone's not believing him that he didn't actually enter the tournament. No one is on Harry's side. He feels so alone in this time. And so you really start to feel for him because of that when he's going through these trials. And I talked about how this movie opens up the world of Potters on a landscape perspective. But because of that PG-13 rating, this is also the movie where Harry Potter is able to grow on a much more mental and character-driven level. The movie opens with a dream sequence where the Riddle's old garden keeper, he's going up to the Riddle house because he hears stuff that's happening. Tom Riddle, as you know, ends up being Voldemort. So the groundskeeper goes up and he sees some people talking in the room. They're talking about Voldemort's comeback, basically. So that sets this nice eerie tone from what we've had in the previous movies. Harry, Hermione, and the Weasleys, they all go to the Quidditch World Cup, and that's really cool until their campsite gets overrun by all these Death Eaters. Those are Voldemort's supporters. They haven't been seen together for years. This is their first group gathering since Voldemort has disappeared. And so the whole movie has this ominous, dark tone behind the scenes. You can just tell something's not right. It's all building towards something. There's this great scene when Harry's talking with Sirius Black through the flu network and the fire in the Gryffindor common room. And Sirius is kind of freaking out about this whole thing too. He's like, why is Harry's name getting put in the Goblet of Fire? He tells Harry that Hogwarts isn't safe anymore. Igor Karkaroff, the headmaster of Durmstrang, he used to be a Death Eater. Barty Crouch, who's leading up the games, he used to be a very radical person against Voldemort, which is good because they need people like that, but he took it too far and he sent his own son to Azkaban. And so you got all these people around Hogwarts that you can't really trust, plus all of these tasks. The whole thing just feels very uneasy in the best type of way. And getting to the tasks, all three tasks I think are really cool, especially the Dragon Child in the first task. That's one scene I feel like the movie actually did better than the book because in the book it's all in the dragon enclosure. In the movie Harry's running around the enclosure, he gets his broom, he flies away, and then the dragon breaks free of the chain, they go zooming all around Hogwarts. And that makes for a really exciting scene that I was surprised to see the effects actually still hold up today. There's a couple of shots where it looks a little dated, especially in the mermaid challenge when they're underwater. Some of those bodies looked a little too CG for me, but I also don't know what a half human, half shark guy looks like, so maybe that's what they look like. Just saying, Crumb's face in that scene, it looked a little Sharknado. Now a lot of my issues with this movie ultimately boiled down to the fact that they're taking like an 800 page book and trying to squeeze it into two and a half hours. This movie moves at a very fast pace, which I like, it doesn't waste any time getting to the action. But because of that, some of the scenes feel a little bit rushed. For instance, the Death Eater scene, the Quidditch World Cup scene, that all feels like a very, very rushed scene. Once you get to Hogwarts, it gels down a little bit. You get to see Alistair Moody, who I haven't mentioned yet, Mad-Eye Moody. He's really awesome. He's the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. There's an awesome scene in his classroom where they're breaking down the unforgivable curses. And so I like those smaller classroom moments that 
they have in this movie. And the book obviously has a couple more scenes like that, and they have some really nice character-driven scenes. And the movie does have those character-driven scenes, but it's also more about getting from set piece to set piece to set piece. Especially near the end, there's only like one or two scenes in between the second and third tasks. And this is just a nitpick, but there are some things in the book that I would have liked to have seen in the movie, but they had to cut it because of time. I do know that this movie was one they were originally considering splitting into two parts. I am ultimately glad that they didn't do that. However, I think especially this movie and Order of the Phoenix, which I'll talk about later, but they could have benefited from the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings extended edition cuts. For instance, there's one scene in the books where Harry, Ron, and Hermione, they go out to Hogsmeade and they meet Sirius in this cave and they're talking about Barty Crouch and the stuff that's going on at Hogwarts. I really like that scene. Apparently that scene was filmed, but they just left it on the cutting room floor. If they had just filmed more scenes like that, like say the whole Quidditch World Cup thing, filmed more of the Death Eaters when they're infiltrating the camps, filmed the whole game, the whole Quidditch World Cup game that we missed. I don't know how big the budget would have gotten for the movie, but film all of that knowing it's not going to make the theatrical cut and then release an extended edition on DVD and Blu-ray. It's like a four hour cut. Yeah, it's still missing stuff from the books, but it would have given a lot more to the movie than what we got in the theatrical release, which is still a good movie though. But that ending with Voldemort is some of the coolest, darkest stuff you'll see in any Harry Potter movie. Ultimately, in the very last challenge, the maze, Cedric and Harry, they get to the cup at the same time. They both connect to it and it ends up being a port key. A port key is some object in Harry Potter that transports you from one place to another. So the port key, the, the cup, transports them to the graveyard by the Riddle House. Wormtail ends up there with a little baby fetus Voldemort thing. He ends up killing Cedric Diggory. This is actually the first death you see on screen in the Harry Potter series. And imagine you are Harry in this situation. You're a 14 year old kid. You're just going, you're like you're in your freshman year of high school. You have to fight off a dragon, mermaids, a maze that's trying to eat you. And then you see this guy die right in front of you. And then you see the guy that's been haunting your dreams for your entire life come to life right in front of you. Yeah, Harry went through a lot in this movie. Getting back to that dark figure that's haunted Harry's dreams, in this movie you finally get to see Ray finds as Voldemort. This was such a good introduction. He doesn't say a whole lot. Like, he says just as much as he needs to. But he's just so calm and calculating, except for when he needs to show his anger and his rage to his Death Eaters that didn't support him when he fell. It's like the first time Darth Vader walks on the scene. You're just like, yep. That's the most evil guy in the wizarding world right there. Harry and Voldemort have a really small duel in the little Hangleton graveyard. That's a really cool scene. Harry gets to see the ghosts of Cedric and his parents and the groundskeeper that was killed at the beginning of the movie. They go more into it in the Deathly Hallows movie and in the Goblet of Fire book, obviously, but the reason their wands connect is because Harry and Voldemort's wands, they share the same core, and so they can't actually, like, attack each other. And that causes you to be able to see the spells that the wands had just committed. So Voldemort's wand had just killed four people, those are the four people that you see in the ghosts, and the, yeah, th that's all in the book. I gotta try to keep my book knowledge away from these movie reviews, because they're I'm reviewing the movies, not the books here. But Harry makes it back to Hogwarts, and it's a really somber scene, because everyone's celebrating when he gets there. And then you see everyone's clapping faces just kind of turn into, like, their shocks of terror. The band slowly stops playing Dumbledore, Amos Diggory, the fudge, you know, all of them, they rush the field. Harry's trying to tell them, like, Voldemort's back, and they all find out Cedric's dead, and it's this really somber, funeral-like scene. To wrap some things up, you find out that Mad-Eye Moody was actually Barty Crouch Jr. for the entire year. The real Mad-Eye Moody was locked in a trunk. He was the one that put Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire. He was also the one that turned the cup into a port key. So he was trying to kill Harry this whole year. And the movie ends on this nice tone, with Dumbledore giving a little eulogy for Cedric, as well as the school's leaving. Harry, Ron, and Hermione, they share these nice moments through the end of the movie where they basically recognize that things are never going to be the same. Fun and games of Hogwarts are slowly dying down. They're entering this new territory where things are getting a lot darker. But they also have this feeling of hope because they have each other with him. And it's just a really nice comforting tone to end on on such a dark movie. So I do really like Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. It's not my favorite movie in the series. That's still Prisoner of Azkaban. It's got great characters. It expands the world in every way possible. My really only hangups with the movie are things that I would have liked to have seen from the books, as well as the fact that the tone is really rushed because they tried to cram so many things in. However, this is ultimately what it comes down to for me. I recognize that these theatrical cuts of the movies can only be so long. I think Goblet of Fire is actually the second longest movie in the series next to Chamber of Secrets. It clocks in about two hours and 37 minutes somewhere around there so in that time that they are allotted they need to make the best possible adaption of this book this source material that they can given their cinematic limitations and i feel like goblet of fire did that they they introduced this whole big world they gave you a new awesome defense against the dark arch teacher and mad eye moody they hit all the main beats of the book like the first task the yule ball the second task the third task the graveyard and i think it's an amazing feat that they're able to cram that much book into this two and a half hour movie and make it a a coherent movie so that's my review for harry potter and the goblet of fire what did you guys think of the movie let me know in the comments down below and thank you so much for watching this video if you liked it you can click subscribe and check out some of my other videos and i'll catch you guys next time